Hi, uh, hello everybody. Uh, so it's uh, great to have such a good turnout for today's School of Informatics Distinguished Lecture. Um, the lecturer is Professor David Dunson, who's Arts and Science Distinguished Professor of Statistical Science, Mathematics and Electrical and Computer Engineering at Duke University. And his visit to Edinburgh is supported by the Carnegie Trust, and he's one of the two Carnegie Centenary Professors uh, for 2018. Now, there are, David has a, uh, is a very eminent statistician with a global reputation. He has, he's a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the Institute for Mathematical Statistics. He's won many prizes and so on, but rather than me bore you with those, I'll let him talk about his topic beyond tech, machine learning, and science and policy. Yeah, th th thanks a lot, Chris, and thanks for the invitation. And um, I'd like to keep this as informal as possible, so, so please interrupt me and, you know, sh with shouting and yelling at me or whatever you like as we go through it. So, so I'm going I'm to start out with um, talking a little bit about, in, in my biased perspective, um, current trends in machine learning and what people call um, AI. Um, and then I'll, it's sort of dim, but I'm, I'm going to be talking about particularly um, how, how can we develop methods for science. Um, Whereas most of the machine learning and AI focus has really been on specifically on tech industry type applications, as I'll talk about, and, and also um, policy making. Okay? Um, and then I'll have a couple of vignettes that I talk a bit about in more detail. The one is uh, machine learning in, in, in um, fairness and criminal justice, and the other is uh, machine learning in science for brain nets and, uh, and traits. Okay, so. Um, so this is really kind of a, a cartoon of machine learning. Um, when, it, when I ask what is machine learning, I'll, I'll, I'll really focus on the kind of core of the discipline. Of course, machine learning is incredibly broad. Anytime anyone's doing anything with data and data analysis, they can call it machine learning. It could be a statistical method. It could be just some ad hoc method you're doing for whatever. You could call it machine learning. But the core of machine, what's the machi core of machine learning in my, in my view? Um, is, is trying to answer questions like, can we design algorithms to, quote, learn from data targeted to specific tasks? Okay, and so um, I, I'd say at, at machine learning, the, the reason we call it machine learning and usually not art, art, artificial intelligence is that you're not really learning in the traditional sense in which maybe a child learns from experience or a student learns from experience. You're, you're instead trying to do um, statistics, essentially, but you're you're trying to design an algorithm for a very specific task um, and, and have a class of algorithms for solving that particular task. Okay. So it's quite similar to the field of statistics in that way, um, but the culture and the type of problems that people work on are, are really fundamentally different between statistics and machine learning. And so it ends up being very, very different even though in both cases you're sort of um, analyzing data, developing algorithms um, targeted to specific tasks. Okay, so some example kind of canonical machine learning questions are, can we design a classifier to output the type of objects in an image has been very, very popular. And, and I, I remember I, I started working on, the, on this type of problem a bit with Larry Karen at Duke um, probably about a decade ago. And, and the, at, at the time, the state of the art wasn't very good and it's gotten really, really dramatically better uh, for this type of problem, particularly natural images. Uh, you take a picture of, of some scenery and what's in the image is, is really quite good now compared to, say, a decade ago. Um, can we automatically label a document with keywords or a summary? And so you have some sort of um, article or something and you don't want to read it, you just want to put, output a summary that would be quite useful in search or other um, tasks. And, and that, that's often gotten a lot, a lot better. Okay. You might even want the summary to be in coherent English. Like, um, and, and not, not just uh, keywords. Can, can we place ads on web pages to maximize um, clicks? That, that's also been a quite, quite popular type of problem. A, a lot of my students go to kind of Google and tech industry and they're, they're working on these types of problems now. Um, another thing that's gotten dramatically better, I'd say, in the last five, 10 years is can we convert audio recordings into text um, without errors or very many errors? You're just talking and then you can convert it into text. That's gotten a lot better. It's a kind of canonical problem. Um, one thing that's been really in the, in the news a lot um, lately is can we design an algorithm for a self-driving car? That's kind of a, a recent question. Okay, so here's some example canonical machine learning questions. 
So, um, so how do we kind of solve these problems? Well, well, first, ideally, we would have labeled data, um, at least if we're doing a kind of um, supervised machine learning. There's also this whole um, literature on unsupervised approaches where you're just trying to kind of uh, learn latent structure, low dimensional structure and data. Um, but we're in general, if we're gonna do some sort of predictive task, um, we're gonna need some labeled data, okay? And so then the machine learning algorithm is only gonna be as good as the data being fed, fed into the algorithm. And that's, that's something that I think partly due to the cultural reasons of the difference between the machine learning um, community that mostly comes from computer science and electrical engineering and the kind of statistics community which is more culturally similar to uh, mathematics and, and takes a different set of courses and everything. Um, it's really important to think about where those data come from and the selection process in which the data are coming in. Okay. And that'll be a repeating theme in the talk. Um, so, so really a key to answering uh, um, the, the machine learning questions I put up is, uh, is having a lot of high quality training data. And that, that's been one of the reasons for the immense breakthroughs in, in, in recent years is, is clever ways to produce lots and lots of training data. Um, the training data are very often obtained by humans, um, some type of crowdsourcing technology. Um, humans are very good at the tasks I've, I've listed, and so if we can mimic humans, um, get a lot of data from humans labeling things, then we, can, then we can potentially do really well in machine learning. Okay, and so certainly humans are good at, you know, give them a picture, what's in the image, humans can label that accurately, they could listen to an audio recording and say what people are saying. Um, they could say who's speaking at what time, a kind of speaker diarizationization problem. Um, so humans are often really, really good, and they can serve as a kind of gold standard for these canonical machine learning problems. They can drive cars reasonably well. Okay, so then we can, um, if we can get human volunteers to label or summarize the content documents, um, um, we can get a lot of labeled data, hopefully easily, using something like Amazon Mechanical Turk um, or other crowdsourcing techniques. Uh, you might instead collect data on, on cars driving under different conditions. There, there was a very bi big um, popular example of the success of kind of machine learning or artificial intelligence uh, was this AlphaGo thing where, where they trained a machine to play Go, which was thought to be much more complicated than chess and maybe very difficult to actually kind of train a machine to beat a human. Um, at Go, and that was successful. One of the reasons was that they could generate tons and tons of labeled data because they could start out with uh, humans playing games and then they could have the machines play against each other. And so it's like easy to generate uh, an enormous amount of, of good uh, training data by having the machines play against each other, which is a kind of specialized um, case of a, of a game, of training a machine to play a game. Okay. Um, also, in, in medicine, radiologists are expert classification of medical images, and the hu humans playing games and computers playing games. Okay. Um, internet browsing behavior, if we're doing any sort of tech industry problem um, involving the web, we can generate tons and tons of training data. So one, one interesting example is um, you, you, one, of, one of my friends, um, uh, Deepak Agarwal was working for Yahoo at the time, and, and they, at the time, they were the most visited website in the world, you know, and they had their front page, and they had four stories on the front page, and there were human interest articles, and a lot of people will go to that front page, and they'll click on these articles, and then they'll put ads on the sides, and the, some people will click on the ads. And so at, at the time, they had, had gotten a, a group of, of people to kind of discuss what what, what articles to put on each day, some English majors and some psychologists and different people, and they would try to guess what, what articles people would find interesting and put them up there, uh, current events. And, and what Deepak did is he would just take some percentage of the flow and he would just uh, do a, a Bayesian a, a active learning and, and see what people clicked on. And then people clicked on things that were very different from what you might anticipate um, maybe less, much less vapid, m much more vapid things, and less intellectual things than the, than the group of people thought. And, and so he improved the click-through rate by, by 30%, which made the company something like $200 million a year, just that one change. Um, and so I, I think that like having a lot of labeled data and doing clever machine learning, you can certainly uh, ma make a lot of money in these industry problems. 
Okay, so I, I'd say that much of um, ML focuses on treating uh, humans as, as gold standards because they're really good at pattern recognition. And so we're doing some sort of pattern recognition task. We can, we can use humans as gold standards. And so if we can mimic human performance in specific tasks, then we've done fantastic, okay? Um, and the algorithms would be then trained to that specific tasks. But we're, we're not going to be able to do very well in other contexts, and there's not going to be learning about the underlying mechanisms, but that's okay if we're sort of targeted for that task. Okay. So um, one, 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 one particular class of algorithms that has been very popular in recent years has been so-called deep learning, okay? And so um, there's been a really huge hype around these kind of deep learning or neural, neural network app, um, and their success in, in these kind of canonical machine learning problems. And so it, it's really kind of created a, a lot of interesting phenomenon. The, the, one, the one is that there is now really huge, huge increases in salaries and jobs. And so, um, for example, um, if, if this is personal, um, for PhDs at, at, at Duke who are, are working on, say, say, deep learning, deep, deep neural networks, um, it, you, would, you should be expected to start a U.S. Uh, making over 300K a year in, in the tech industry currently. Um, and there's been a lot of um, cases where, you know, somebody like uh, Chris or somebody like me or somebody who works on machine learning, if we went to industry, a lot of these people would be making well over a million dollars a year. Um, the, you know, the, um, the chair of the Mi Michigan Biostat Department just left making $2 million a year, it's reported. Um, so um, there's, a, there's kind of huge salaries and there's a huge, um, um, you know, trying to grab talent into many different industries so that we can kind of, they can remain competitive and as we, we, we have this rise of kind of artificial intelligence and machine learning in all sorts of different domains. Okay. Um, and and th this is partly attributable to the success of, of, of deep learning and related methods. So deep learning is, is essentially a rebranding of, of neural networks, which had been around for, for a long, long time. Um, and the, the, the essential models that people are using successfully in these cases haven't changed that much, really. Um, so your, your, your game is to kind of learn the relationship between input and outputs. And if you have a, a deep learning, that means you take a, a, a neural network and you, you put in lots of layers. And so you have some inputs here, so you observe those, say. You have some outputs over here that you observe, and so you'd like to maybe predict these outputs based on the inputs, and we'd like to have a really flexible model to do that because we don't know what that input-output relation is, and so we put in a lot of these kind of hidden layers, okay? And they're gonna be then extremely flexible. They might involve uh, millions, um, hundreds of millions of unknown parameters that can be estimated from data. We can kind of tune these parameters to kind of good performance because we can hold out some of the data on the outputs and then look, look at cross-validation to see how things do and then tune the algorithm to do really well, okay? Um, certainly there are black box uh, mapping from inputs to outputs. And so we, um, I've, I've heard a number of talk, really bad talks, to be honest, on, on trying to do kind of interpretable machine learning where you're, you're estimating some deep neural network and then you try to actually interpret what these layers are. That, that's a bit of a flaky business. So I'm sure people will come up with something. Um, so the parameters are, are really not very well what you would call um, the statistical lingo identified, and so you, you, can't, you can't maybe estimate this link very well, even though you might be able to estimate the, the overall input-output relationship quite well. Um, so it's been interesting that neural networks, I remember when I was a grad student and early, uh, early on in my career, neural, uh, neural networks were a complete joke. Like people were like, well that's terrible, that's the worst thing ever because they, they were notorious for like uh, overfitting the data and so they would just chase the data. They were horribly overparameterized. Um, they were completely uninterpretable and they were kind of computationally intractable. And so they were, they were completely a joke, I would say. But, and so, um, so what, what's kind of changed? It's been kind of interesting in recent years and it's been really quite, quite recent that, that, that they've kind of um, jumped back to the forefront. So, um, so, so what's changed? This is the, the kind of hype curve where you have some sort of new technology and then everyone's like, it's really excited and they're like, well, actually it kind of sucks a lot of things and then they kind of improve, improve upon it. Um, but I, I'd say kind of three factors have improved the performance and popularity of these kind of methods. Um, 
The one is, as I've mentioned, this kind of uh, large label data sets are really important, I think. And so if we have if we have this really incredibly complicated model that we're trying to fit, then we need maybe a lot of data to fit it very accurately. Um, because it's not, it has so many parameters, how are, we, how are we gonna learn about those parameters? Well, if we have hundreds of millions of, it, of labeled images, or audio re recordings, or countless zillion hours of cars driving around under different conditions, then we have a lot of labels, we have a lot of data, and then we can kind of tie down these parameters reasonably well to learn this input-output relationship. Um, obviously, there's been huge improvements in computing, and we can have access to many computers in a network. Um, th there's also been really wonderful developments in, in engineering of software and algorithms. And, and one thing that's been really um, nice and cool, I think, is TensorFlow um, and related things where you have some sort of package that does automatic differentiation. And so you can come in a very a broad variety of different settings. And you can have a pretty novice user that can kind of uh, play around with these um, deep neural networks pretty quickly. I, I had a friend, um, one of our D D Duke students who went to tech, and he was like used to doing Bayesian probability modeling, and it's like, well, geez, this deep neural networks are doing really well, and he, let's try them out. And like within a couple hours, he figured out how to use TensorFlow, and then by, but like a day later, he's like an expert in deep networks. Um, and so it, it's not much different than that, I guess. And that's one of the reasons that they've kind of proliferated so much is that we have a way to, to implement them easily. And if you have some more complicated um, method that, that there's a much bigger um, difficulty entering the field, then people aren't going to, to take it up as much. Okay, uh, okay. So, so certainly these three have led to exciting improvements in the type of problems, and it's really impacted all our lives. I mean, I mean this, um, my, my son and wife use this Amazon Echo all the time. It's really pretty cool. Like, it's this tower, and you like can ask it questions. It's like, well, what's the weather? It's, and you can like ask it to uh, you know, tell you jokes, and it almost like seems like it has sort of a personality. Um, and so they, they've gotten quite, quite addicted to it. You can tell it to set the alarm. You, you, do also, you can have it control various things in your house. Uh, it's pretty cool. Um, recommender systems, web search, voice recognition software, we all use these things constantly now. Okay, but um, this is mainly a talk ripping on these kind of machine learning and deep learning and stuff, so I need to now go to more negatives, I guess, but, um, and Chris, I, 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 saw, I stupidly sent him a version of the talk and he, he, he was complaining a, a bit about some of these slides, but, so I hope, hopefully I'll get some more complaints. But I, but I would say that, um, Neural networks, and, and Mike Jordan had a recent article where he, he said similar things. Um, but neural networks are not really a model of the human brain. And so I, I've been working a lot on, on, on neuroscience applications and modeling the human brain. And, and this kind of input-output thing, that, that is like not really even a toy model of the human brain. And so that's, that's often a uh, misconception. So even though they're called a neural network, like we're actually modeling real neural networks and the neural network model doesn't look like a model you would use for a real neural network. Um, they're not really um, getting us closer to what I'd call true artificial intelligence. Um, they, they can, they can do, do quite well in these narrow tasks, but they don't have an ability to reason or generalize beyond the context in which they're trained. It's more like a particular statistical model um, than artificial intelligence, in my view. Um, they, they, they kind of suck at generalizing beyond the specific context in which they were trained. Um, that's a bit of overfitting still going on there, I think. Um, and they, they don't really think or generalize logically to new settings. Okay. Um, and so they, I could kind of give this self-driving car vignette. Uh, I think self-driving cars are really promising, actually. But, um, but you can imagine that if we came in um, and then we, we had some data set on cars driving and then we trained a deep neural network to like drive automatically, um, that this kind of lack of reasoning and generalizability may, may create problems. And where it creates problems is when you're in an unanticipated situation. So you have some training data that's in some setting, like in nice driving conditions and when things are going well, and then something weird happens then you know, if something weird happens and there's no kind of, it's just this black box structure where there's no like physical model or carefully structured model or, or constraints or anything, or, or, or true artificial intelligence, then, then you can't kind of generalize, you can't kind of shift over to do well in this other setting. And so if you've trained it all 
in conditions where the road isn't icy and then you throw in an icy road, then the algorithm is gonna be just a complete disaster, okay? And so that, that's certainly the case. Whereas a human, even if they were never on the icy road before, they're smart enough and so they can adapt quickly. They can adapt quickly with limited training data where, where these algorithms can't do that. What's the caption on the cartoon? Oh, it said, oh, sorry. Uh, does your car have any idea why my car pulled it over? <laughs> um, okay, so, um, so the car won't know how to react in this setting. So I think this is fine, though, for self-driving cars because we know about this. And so we're not so stupid to only, only um, have training data that are in good conditions we would be smart enough to put in training data in all sorts of crazy conditions, every crazy condition we could anticipate, you know, like bad drivers around you, bad road conditions, bad weather conditions, et cetera. And so that's why I think this self-driving car problem should be, should be solvable. Um, and so I, I think that we should, you know, maybe already have accident rates that are significantly lower than human drivers. And what, one of the um, interesting uh, as we get into these kind of artificial intelligence technology phenomenon is that we kind of hold these algorithms or computers to a higher standard than we would humans and so um, so people like freak out if there's one accident uh, for a self-driving car whereas if you had a, like you have you don't feel bad at all of having some sort of weird uber drivers probably stoned <laughs> driving you around somewhere um, and then the accident, accident rates are pretty high, maybe, but, um, but if, if the kind of robot driver um, ever crashes like somewhere in Kansas or something and there hasn't even been one in North Carolina or Scotland, then, then you're freaking out and you don't want to use the, the self-driving um, capacity. So that's quite a, kind of interesting. Um, okay, so what creates critical problems for deep learning? I want to transition into science and policy. I, I would say certainly limits, limited or biased training data. There, there's been some really dramatically bad, like, oh, I'm, because uh, one of the problems is that a lot of people kind of jump in and now they know how to use uh, TensorFlow, they know, know how to fit deep neural networks or, the, or other machine learning algorithms. Um, and they, oh, well, now we can go in and solve like medical problems or we can solve problems over here. I can just scrape a bunch of data, get a bunch of healthcare records, and now like I'll apply it. Um, but not thinking carefully about um, the selection me method where, with, where the data is collected, you can get really bad, bad results. And so I've seen a bunch of, of talks like that where um, my original training was in biostatistics, and so I worked a ton in medical applications, and um, people would come in and they, they could kind of collect a bunch of medical records data, and they're like, oh, I want to predict death, or I want to predict some disease. And they have a bunch of data, you're like, I mean, there's a ton of examples like this. And then, well, it occurs over time. And so the person has the disease at some time point. And then after that, they have some treatment for it. And they have a diagnostic code. And they have this other, they just take all the features. And they're like, oh, we perfectly predict that they have this disease. One of your features is like something that came after the disease, which is like only occurs if the disease happens. And so, wow, you're doing really great because it's sort of like a, a lack of understanding of kind of selection bias and time ordering and careful structure in the data. So we can't, we can't ignore structure in the data or we're going to do really, really bad. Um, another example, which I'll get to soon, is about what's, what, what, there's, a, there's a rise of people wanting to use machine learning and policy, things like predict, predictive policing, for example. And so, like, we have limited police resources. We should be patrolling where crimes are likely to occur, okay? Well, maybe we'll start out with um, looking at where crimes are kind of occurring now. And so maybe now they're patrolling, like, in the U.S., in these kind of uh, African-American low-income neighborhoods. And they go out there, and they're finding crime because they're there. They're looking there. And then, and then now, okay, we take th that as our training data, and then now we look there more, and we find more and more crime, and then pretty soon we're like hanging out all, all the time in the African American neighborhood, and it looks like the African Americans are like horrible criminals when the police are like stopping them randomly and they find some marijuana or some minor drug offense.
which they would probably find if they went in the, in the, the high income white neighborhood too. Um, but yeah, so it has these kind of, can have these feedback loops due to this kind of biased uh, selection bias. Selection bias is a huge issue. It can enormously affect results. So this isn't just for deep learning. Um, in science, we'd like to learn mechanisms underlying relationships in the data. We could apply some sort of unsupervised learning method, but, but we, we would really like to learn mechanisms with uncertainty quantification, a, a, an ability to test hypotheses about those mechanisms. That's really not in most machine learning methods. Um, providing results that are easily interpretable is important in science and in policy. Um, uncertainty is really important. I think that a lot of, um, a lot of data, data, sci uh, data science methods broadly, statistics, machine learning, have gone the way, the, a really negative way in my view in that uh, we have really big complicated data sets and so we need to come up with algorithms that are really fast for fitting these big complicated data sets and so something has to give. So we throw out uncertainty quantification. And so now I look at like, I'm, I'm looking at predicting some health outcome based on genetics or something and, uh, and I, I'm going to do a sparse method and then it'll spit out some genes um, that are predicting lymphoma and, and I'll look at those genes and I'll be really carefully interpreting them not knowing that there might be another 10,000 sets of genes that are equally consistent with the data but, but I just happen to select those because I have this kind of high dimensionality problem. And so I, I need to characterize uncertainty or I've just in science you've just like you're reading tea leaves, you're, you're just throwing in enormous numbers of uh, false positives into the literature, and so that's a disaster. Um, you know, hypothesis testing has gotten to be a dirty word, but you know, I work a lot with scientists and, and they're, doing, they're going to be doing hypothesis testing, and so we need, to, we need methods to do hypothesis testing. Um, and and I, yeah, machine learning doesn't, doesn't almost ever, ever look at hypothesis testing. Okay, so, um, so let's get, get into the weeds a bit with the science, science and policy um, areas. Okay, so just a, just a blurb on science and then policy, and then I'll get more into specifics. Okay, so, um, so in science, I would say definitely most of the intellectual energy in machine learning and statistics is focused on industry problems. I'm the editor of JRSS B, which is arguably the top journal in statistics, and, and we get very many articles that are these kind of high dimensional inference methods without uncertainty quantification that might be good for tech problems but not so good for science. Um, the problems are really different from scientific research settings. So, um, so in science we tend to have more and more complicated or big data like here's a person, I collect a whole bunch of stuff on the person. There's all sorts of new technology for collecting ever more increasing dimensionality data on you. I can collect all sorts of biomedical data, now through, there's going to be, there's all these incredible sensors and so now I can wear like a watch and I'm collecting all this information on your exercise behavior. Pretty soon the sensors are going to be able to collect a biologic information on you as well. And so these monitors or sensor data analysis incredibly interesting and important. But you can imagine that I have some number of people in a study, maybe a thousand if I have a pretty big study, but I'm measuring, I can measure maybe hundreds of millions of things about you. And then how do I figure out which things are important? That's really hard. That's really hard. It's the opposite of this kind of machine learning problems. Humans suck at it. I can't look at somebody's genome and make any sense of it. I have no labeled, I have very limited labeled data. And, and people suck at it. And, and I can't just use these usual machine learning tools. If I use these kind of high dimensional sparse methods, I just, it'll just spit out a set of genes or a set of biomarkers, but I, they, they might be totally wrong. They probably are. Um, we don't want a black box. We, we want to interpret things. Um, no matter what scientists I work with, if I, did, if I have an amazing method for predicting Y from X, they want to know, well, why does it predict Y from X? What's, the, what's going on? And so the kind of whole point of science is to test hypotheses, learn unanticipated relationships, improve understanding of mechanisms uh, and, and in the light of these kind of big complicated data sets. And we're sort of in the dark ages with, with respect to that, partly because everyone's working on these tech problems. Okay, so one example that I've been super excited about, and, and I'll be giving a sort of public lecture um, tomorrow just focused entirely on human brain connectomics. Um, is human brain connectomics. So now we can go and take a bunch of people and put them in MRI machines 
and measure your brain structure. We could also maybe in that same study measure different traits on you. And you get these incredible pictures. And so here's, uh, here's Chris's brain, okay? Um, and like if we zoom in, um, his brain, his structural brain connectome is made up of millions of little tube, narrow tubes, white matter tracks, that, which are like highways for neural activity and communication. So if I zoom in and look at like just um, connections between a pair of brain regions, here, here's a bunch of like um, little narrow highways, of brain, um, brain electrode highways between those brain regions, okay? And so I can kind of map the whole, this whole connectome. And so the technology for like image processing and image collection has been improving dramatically. But now, now I have one of these things for everyone in my study. And I have maybe a thousand people in my study in a really big study like the Human Connectome Project or the UK Biobank also has similar data. And so what do I do with that? I, I mean, this is really complicated, high dimensional. How do I like figure out how does this relate to um, depression or um, autism or Parkinson's disease or creativity or other things, okay. Um, yeah, uh, and I'll get back to that. So, so another thing that we run into is this policy type questions. And so there's a lot of interest in using machine learning tools and policy and, and to automate decision making, partly because um, we, we want to take, 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 um, ha have some sort of objective decision maker. So any human you can imagine is very biased probably. Like you think that, well now at the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, you, you have an administrator who's quite a bit different than the administrator that would have been under Obama. And so they, um, are they really both looking at the same data and science and, and driving their policies? Can we like have a robot kind of take the data and have some sort of objective um, policy recommendation that you could then have humans look at at least? Um, that, that would be amazing. And so that would be in many, many different domains that, that if we could do that, it's really cool. And so machine learning people have started working on these things. So we'd like to remove to the extent possible the influence of human biases and prejudices. So I'd say environmental risk assessment, um, automated um, bail or sentencing and criminal justice. And so th this to me is really personal. So my, my older son had um, drug problems, which is an epidemic now. And, but I'm a, you know, an upper middle class, uh, upper class uh, Caucasian in the US. He is, okay, so we go, we go in there and you're in the, you're in the courtroom. And the, a lot of the other people are like low income African Americans. And so if my son was a low-income African-American, he would be in prison. But I, I could pay for a high-priced uh, high, high lawyer, and the, the system is biased. And so he got off, completely, completely off. And it would not be, not be the case. So I'd like to be able to develop tools that get rid of that bias automatically, okay? That would be really cool, I think. Because it's ridiculous how biased the system is. So. Okay, so, um, but if we're gonna do this, data, questions of data quality, how do we control for selection bias are really paramount. Okay, so what can we do with these, about these problems? So we need ML methods that are carefully targeted to the problem of interest, I think. And so, um, so that kind of gets away from yeah, there was some, some sort of like ridiculous book on like the ultimate algorithm or something where, where, where we have, I won't say who wrote it, but um, um, it, where, where the thought is that, well, the data, the data, nothing can be biased. We should have some sort of like algorithm that can solve all problems. So I, I would think that that's really not possible to me, I think. I think that we need, we need methods that are, at least for now, before we have some really true artificial intelligence robots that can figure out how to do things or something and target the, it themselves. Um, we need methods that are carefully targeted to the problem of interest. So we can't be agnostic to the data collection pro process. You know, Usually data collection processes in the wild are very biased and they, they have lots of selection mechanisms that need to be taken into account. Um, and so there's been disasters due to the lack of understanding. And so, um, so one example I've already given this applying deep learning uh, records to predict patient outcomes. Uh, prediction of recidivism risk based on arrest data. So recidivism, that means um, 
are, are you going to commit another crime? And so you're sitting there and the judge is setting bail for you. And there's my son and then there's that other kid, okay? And they've had the same crime. They've had possession of cocaine or something. And now, now we need to set bail, okay? And so what's the judge, is, well, well, part of the decision there is, it, you know, is the kid gonna commit another crime? Okay, and so if we can predict that accurately, it's like, oh, if they're gonna commit another crime while they're out, then we should have the bail high and leave them in jail. Yeah. Um, but if we take the current data, which are definitely select, have a lot of selection bias, certainly for drug offenses, African Americans are stopped more in the US, then we're gonna predict a higher re recidivism risk for African Americans and then therefore set a much higher bail for African Americans, which is, would not be fair um, and might not actually reflect the kind of true recidivism risk, might reflect a selection bias in arrests. Um, yeah, I mentioned the predictive policing feedback loops. Okay, so let's d do a dive into a, a fairness with a, a couple slides on this. Um, so we, we, I've really gotten into this through, um, through collaboration with a, a, a fantastic couple of former Duke students. The one is James Jondro, who's amazing, who's now at Stanford as a Stein Fellow. And then really Christian Lum has been the kind of brains behind this operation. And so she works on this kind of fairness problems for a human rights organization. And so we recently got a, um, got a grant from the Arnold Foundation to work on these things. Um, Okay, so we'd like to be able to kind of develop methods to kind of de-bias machine learning algorithms and things like sentencing, hiring, policing, college admissions, parole decisions, um, et cetera, okay? Remove gender or, or race, for example. So the reason for using ML, or the reason ML, people want to use ML is the perceived neutrality of computers, but, but um, we have this problem with the selection bias. Okay, so, um, so here, I'd like to just kind of sh um, flash up some results where we, we wanted a method to take some training data and kind of purify the training data. So, so the training data are like subject to lots of selection biases, we're gonna suppose. And we have maybe African American ethnicity in there, and then we have a bunch of other features of this individual, okay? And then we're, we wanna predict recidivism. And so if we, if we, if we wanna remove the influence of African American ethnicity, so how do we do that? Well, if we could, if we could throw out African American ethnicity and then and then tweak the features a little bit, so that the resulting predictions did not re were not systematically different between African Americans and Caucasians, then that that's the sort of thing we want to do. And then we can provide these 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 fairness preserving features, and people could go to town, use whatever predictive algorithm they want, deep neural networks, uh, random forest, whatever. Okay. So that's, that's the game we're gonna play. And, and James and Christian have this nice paper, uh, essentially accepted, I think, in Annals of Plot Statistics and available in archive, playing a similar game. And so what we were, we were gonna do is just something really, really um, simple. So we have some, some covariate Z indicating um, race or ethnicity. So we're gonna pre-process our feature matrix to remove the influence of Z. It's not enough to throw Z out because the features might be able to perfectly predict Z, in which case throwing Z out is not gonna do anything. Okay. Um, and so then we're gonna replace this data matrix A with this, this um, cleaned up version A tilde, um, minimizing information loss in a formal sense um, while making it orthogonal from this race indicator. Um, and, then we, and then we just can apply any machine learning algorithm. And so we did this um, to, for criminal risk assessment. And we have this amazing data set coming online, but it's been wrapped up with lawyers for months and months and months. And so I'll, I'll present the results for a less amazing data set. And so it's risk of recidivism for bail decisions is what we're interested in. The, I think the bail bondsmen are really not in favor of these kinds of methods. And so, um, and so apparently the legal implications are wrapped up with the lawsuits related to that. Okay, so, but there's this, uh, the older data set is from ProPublica, and so they have, um, and so we, we want to, we analyze the data from ProPublica. So I'd like to just show the results. Okay, so let, let me start with the top here, and so 
What we're looking at the distribution of out of sample predictions for the probability of recidivism. The top is without any of our sanitization approaches. Here is just taking the original features, including race. Um, and it's the distribution for um, Caucasians and non-Caucasians. And so the Caucasians is shifted back. And so we, we have very significantly less um, um, recidivism risk predicted among the Caucasians than the non-Caucasians. Okay. If we just throw out race as a predictor, it has no impact at all because the features we have can predict race. If we do our fair prediction learning approach, and it's just a simple like principal components type idea, then it, it, removes, um, it removes the influence of, of, of race completely, essentially completely. And so then the, um, the thought that we had is, well, what's the risk there? Okay, so we can remove the influence of race, but then maybe we're, we're decreasing our predictive power. Okay, so then we might not be able to predict as well. But um, what, what I was amazed by is that that was not the case. That's the like cool punchline is that the, the out of sample AUC was, was, point, was 0.72 including race, um, it was 0.71 using these sanitized features, and so, which wasn't statistically significant difference. Okay? So it do doesn't, didn't actually, in this data set anyway, in other contexts it might be different, um, improve your prediction to have a racially biased um, re recidivism prediction. So. But it could make a big difference in people's lives, certainly, so doing these types of things. Okay, so that's... Um, that's the fairness, and I was going to wrap up with a kind of cool neuroscience application. Okay, so I'm really excited about this brain connectome stuff. I'm really super excited about it. So the data for each person looks like this kind of amazing um, geometrically structured object of all these little tubes going through people's brains, okay? So we could call that for individual eye, we could call that some connectome XI, which is this kind of complicated object. Um, and so uh, the connectome can be represented in lots of different ways. Um, one, one simple way is to you take your brain and you break it up into a bunch of regions, and then now you have all these little narrow tubes, and then you could look at a pair of regions and say, oh, well, how many tubes do I have connecting each pair of regions? And then now I've turned this nasty object into a, a matrix, okay? Okay, and then if you made it just binary, you could say, oh, X, I, U, V is one. If there's any connection between regions U and V for individual I, and X, I, U, V is equal to zero otherwise, and then you have like a, a, a graph value uh, data, okay? And so our goal here is to study how do, how do these brain connectomes vary across people, and how does that variation relate to uh, traits of the people, okay? Um, and we'd like to do that in an interpretable manner. Um, and so we, we were able to come up with, I'm not going to go into any of the, the math details, but you could, you could non-parametrically model the variation in brain networks using an approach that characterized uncertainty. And so the, the label here is really small, but this is a, so an individual with low creative reasoning, high creative reasoning, low creative reasoning. Here's another individual with low creative reasoning, one with high creative reasoning. Okay. And so we want to characterize that kind of variation in their brain connectome. Here's the right hemisphere and the left hemisphere of the brain. Okay. And so we have this uh, XI connectome, and it's, it has some population distribution P. We don't know what the heck that is. Um, and so we can kind of write down a little kind of factor model, hierarchical model for that, and then use Bayesian methods to induce uncertainty in this P, um, so-called non-parametric Bayesian methods. Um, okay, and then we can use that um, to address our, our interests in terms of hypothesis testing and inferences on relationships with traits, okay? It'll automatically cluster individuals in terms of their brain structure, so people who have kind of similar structured brains will be assigned to the same cluster. Um, we can test for relationships between brain structure and other things. I'll show results quickly for creative reasoning and Alzheimer's disease. Um, using these types of methods, we're actually able to find like really incredibly cool results, which I'll, I'll talk about in detail tomorrow. But the one was that um, a history of binge drinking was very significant 
uh, like negative in terms of brain brain structure, like decreasing um, connections in the brain. If you had um, in the past had some some days with very high numbers of max drinks, like you've had 21 drinks in one or more in one day, um, that was bad. <laughs> Marijuana smoking had almost the same effect as the binge drinking on the brain structure. And so it's kind of cool. Okay, and so we can like use Bayesian methods to figure out, um, get, get some significance tests. So are there differences across groups and brains in the distribution of brain structure? And also, uh, where are those differences allowing for uncertainty, quantification, and multiple testing? Okay, so here's, here's the results for creativity. So we had a, our collaborator ran a study where um, he, he enrolled a bunch of um, college-age student type people and they gave them a, a creative reasoning test. And we, we took a bunch of the people who had a low creative reasoning score and a bunch with a relatively high creative, creative reasoning score and then we tested using these Bayesian optometric methods for a difference. And so the, the posterior, the probability that there was a difference with creative, um, in brain structure with creative reasoning was uh, 0 0.995, which is amazingly high. And we could also find where the differences were. And so, so here's the brain, okay? Here's the kind of frontal lobe of the brain. Here's the two different hemispheres. And so a green edge, what does that mean? That means that there is um, significantly um, let more connections with people with high creativity, okay? Between the, these two regions. And so I've only flagged, there's lots of different possible connections, I've only flagged the ones that were significantly, statistically significantly different um, between those two groups. And you can see all of these significantly different ones are, are cross hemisphere connections, okay? Particularly in the frontal lobe. And so highly creative individuals tend to have more connections across the hemisphere in the front of their brain. Um, and we, we had like a press release on this and it was pretty interesting. The, the um, people probably heard of the right left brain hypothesis thing. And so um, the, 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 that guy who came up with that hypothesis has died, but his son contacted us and said, oh, he, his dad would have been really excited about this because he, he ended up not believing at all in this right brain left brain hypothesis. <laughs> Um, that he thought it was more cross-hemisphere connections or something like that, and that, that was actually what we found in our data. So that's kind of cool. But we should remember that because it, these things stick, though. This like left brain, right brain, people still use that all the time, even though it is not really true. Okay, um, we also did it for Alzheimer's disease. Um, so we looked at um, s subjects with Alzheimer's disease and age-matched individuals having normal aging. And so now our higher level of our response is Alzheimer's disease before it was creative reasoning. And so now the higher level is bad. And so if as Alzheimer's disease um, is related to less connections in the brain, then we should see a lot of red edges in places where there's less connections. Okay. So first we found it was hugely, ridiculously significant um, differences, or the overall test. Um, and Alzheimer's disease did, did lead to a lot less connect, connections in the brain, which is kind of known. It would be really interesting to get a data set where you had very early stage Alzheimer's disease. So here is the kind of bleak picture. Um, so here is all of the location, the, the connections um, in the brain that are significantly, occur significantly less in people with Alzheimer's disease versus age match controls. Okay, so I'll wrap up there. We're sort of out of time. Um, but I gave kind of a brief overview of recent techniques in machine learning, focusing on deep learning. I, I talked about some positive aspects, but also some negative aspects of, of these types of algorithms and approaches, particularly if you want to use them outside of their canonical application areas and, and tech type applications to, to science or policy. Um, yeah, so in these other cases, we need to really carefully think about selection bias and, and I think develop targeted methods. And I gave a couple of illustrations. I'd like to just kind of wrap up with some acknowledgements. Um, this was with some, some, some former students who are fantastic. Daniele Durante, who's now at Padua, um, did the Brain Connect Home stuff. Um, Emmanuel did the Fair Predictive Learning, and, and, and these, the, these two are James and Christian, who are like the gurus of this kind of Fair Predictive Learning area. And here's just the uh, references. 